This um, panel is really my favorite uh, part of the show. Uh, and uh, we, uh, uh, we do this every year. We've been doing it for some time. And I think it's quite an important panel. Uh, governance issues of critical importance to boards and investors. This is really where we hear from the uh, large institutions, both uh, public and private, uh, and from the uh, corporate and legal community on what is, what is going to be the important issues coming up for the year. And I'll tell you, what has been interesting about this panel is that I've learned more from this panel quality and correct information about where we're ending up than almost any one of these I see around the country each year. Uh, when the whole debate on index, the index's response to dual class stock appeared, it really started here. That was the very first response I heard that the indexes would, the, the institutions would rely on the indexes to deal with the issue uh, as opposed to dealing with them uh, at the IPO stage. And I think uh, you will learn quite a bit from this group. We have a couple of repeat and new players here. Uh, Glenn Borum, to my uh, immediate right, is the investment stewardship officer and principal at Vanguard. Uh, Glenn basically uh, is in charge of, of the vote proxy voting at Vanguard, which is a significant role. Vanguard, as you know, owns yeah, about you know 10 percent of the stock of every publicly traded company out there through the indexes. And uh, obviously, the voting uh, by Vanguard in those companies is quite significant. And Glenn has been in that role for a long time. Uh, we've, uh, he's involved, as a member of the investor, uh, Vanguard's rep of the Investor Stewardship Group, which is headquartered here, uh, the Investor Advisory Group for the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, SAS, and uh, frankly has been a, a, a very important part of the governance story uh, and community for a long time. I'm delighted he's back with us. Uh, and and uh, frankly, Vanguard is just up the road. And uh, one of the very first speakers we had here when I came here was your founder, John Bogle, who just passed away. And John was always fun, entertaining, and engaging on this particular topic, um, and quite missed. Um, Aisha uh, Stagney, seated next to uh, uh, Glenn, she is with Calsters. Calsters is obviously one of the largest equity funds in the country. It's the California State Teachers Retirement System. And she is the corporate governance face of uh, Calsters. Uh, Calsters is an important one, too, uh, in that Calsters and CalPERS were really at the forefront of uh, using the vote as a way to influence governance. And Calsters has actually, I think, really taken the, taken the reins from CalPERS at this point. Uh, well, in the, in that particular area, what? I said I won't tell him you said that. Please don't. <laughs> no. Well, I'll push him. I'll push him a little bit. You know. Can, but uh, Cal Sturz has been incredibly active uh, in the area in voting, and uh, I th again, hearing from the, the public pension funds voting sort of theory or thoughts for the year, I think it's going to be quite important as well. And we have a, uh, a, 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 a a newbie, I guess, here, Eric uh, Shastel from BlackRock, also. A voter at BlackRock. I guess we, we separated, by the way, Glenn and Eric by a, a public fund because <laughs> Macy's and Gimbel's are not next door. They're kind of right. across the street down the road. Uh, obviously, BlackRock uh, is also where Vanguard owns 10, BlackRock probably does too, <laughs> or 9, or 11, uh, and is another significant uh, equity investor, index investor, and, and again, has uh, Eric's responsibilities there. Uh, in the voting angle, voting in are quite substantial. He started actually at ISS, also a voting advisory service, uh, long ago and far away, uh, and then went to the New York State Common Retirement Fund uh, in the same role, and now has moved to the private sector, if you will, from the public sector and the advisory sector uh, on voting. And we're delighted to, he's here, and we're delighted to have an ISS alum as well here. I have the keys to the kingdom, so. Yeah, a lot of people in this room had some <laughs> old ISS tales. Uh, seated next to Eric is an old friend, Steve Odlin. Steve and I go back to uh, AutoZone days. In fact, I remember meeting Steve uh, at, at, at a, what was it? Like, it was like a bad restaurant when you were first hired. You drove up. I was at Mar you, when you came to Baltimore, we met Steve. Uh, had been a, uh, well, had been a chairman and CEO of AutoZone. Uh, he had been at Quaker, he had been at, uh, uh, at Pepsi, and uh, then went on to Office Depot. But today, in his current role, is the um, head of the conference board, which is probably the great 
establishment uh, business organization in the United States. It dates back to 19, I think 1917, Steve, and uh, is the great spokes spokesman, if you will, of the uh, of, of the of the large cap corporate community. Uh, and uh, Steve, we thought would be a great uh, sort of respondent, if you will, sitting on the other side of the votes of these folks. Steve also serves on the board of General Mills and has for a long time. And uh, I believe you chair the governance committee, General Mills. And uh, we've been good friends for many, many years. And uh, his perspectives are always fun and interesting. And uh, we're delighted uh, he, he could be, be with us. Uh, we, had, we had some fun and exciting times. At Austin. As I mentioned, he and I tried to recruit Indra to our board. Not successfully, but we had a, ni we had a nice visit. Right? And, uh, she she but, did all uh, right without us. Yeah, I think she did perfectly <laughs> OK. I agree. Uh, and, uh, but we're delighted Steve could join us today. Uh, and seated next to Steve is Chief Justice Steele. We've heard from earlier. Chief Justice Steele was former Chief Justice of the Delaware Supreme Court. Before that, he had been on the uh, Court of Chancery uh, and is currently, and before that, a Superior Court judge. You were, no, you were in Superior Court, Myron. Uh, no. Yes, I was. Oh, okay, okay, I thought so. All right. Thank you for forgetting that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you have. No. <laughs> no. No. But. Uh, uh, but uh, Chief Justice Steele, uh, following uh, ret uh, retirement from Chief Justice job, uh, is now a partner at Potter Anderson Caroon in Wilmington, and obviously chairman of our advisory board, but also a, uh, a, a lawyer's lawyer. And uh, we wanted to get the, sort of the Delaware angle from him on the, on the ideas that were being proposed in this panel, because a lot of this will be affected, or will be affected by or affect Delaware law. And I can't think of anyone better to talk about it than uh, Chief Justice Steele. He's also a fellow Wahoo, for those of you in the room who know what that means. You, you, we went to UVA Law School. There are a couple of those <coughs> floating around. And uh, it's uh, terrific to uh, have him back on this panel and obviously as our, our, our fantastic chair of the advisory board. Anyway, with that, I'm going to start. We're going to kind of move down the road here. We'll start with uh, Glenn. Glenn, what are the issues that you're thinking about this year? What do you what do you find to be issues of importance to uh, Vanguard uh, on the government side this year? Thanks, Charles, and, and thanks for thanks for having us back. It's it's great to see how how much this program has grown year over year. Um, so many of you are, are repeat attendees, and for those of you who were here last year, I apologize if some of the things I'm going to say today sound very similar. To what I said last year, but that's because um, there's a lot. There's been a lot of consistency uh, year over year in the things that are important to us, um, and they they continue to evolve. So there there are some changes, but also a lot of a lot of similarity over time, and that's really anchored in in our position as by virtue of most uh, most of our assets being in index funds, being a practically permanent owner of most of the companies in in our funds portfolios. Um, so, you know, our focus on behalf of the 20 million clients who have entrusted their assets to us over time is to pursue those things that we think will add value over that long term. And those are relatively consistent year over year. So let me just talk to you a little bit about the things that are front of mind for us now as they have been in years past and some of the ways, some of the ways that they've evolved. Um, and as, as we think about our views on, on governance, there are really four, four pillars that we focus our, um, focus our engagement and our voting on. And the first among those, really a first among equals, is, is the role of the board of directors. Um, and given, given our focus on long, longer term performance, one of the things that we really focus on, um, and this really came out in Indra's comments earlier, is the alignment between the composition of the board and the company's long-term strategy, right? How are these the right dozen or so people um, that bring a set of capabilities and background to the table that are aligned with the company's long-term value creation? And how is that evolving over time in the same way that the company's strategy is evolving? So we focus on things like understanding the process for board uh, evaluation over time, how the board evolves, and how that translates into both t today's composition of the board and how that'll evolve going forward. We look at areas such as 
uh, diversity of skills, experience, and background, and how that aligns with the company's long-term strategy, but also diversity on personal characteristics over time, again, in ways that help uh, bring a diverse set of opinions and perspectives to the tables because we believe and research shows that diverse groups make better decisions. And, and the board at the end of the day um, is, is a decision-making body in overseeing the company. So over the last couple of years, what you, what you would have heard from us is an increasing focus on gender diversity in the boardroom. And that continues to be part of our story, but going forward, we're, we're broadening that dialogue with companies to focus more on a holistic range of diversity, uh, of gender, ra age, uh, race, and ethnicity in ways that help bring a diverse set of perspectives to the table. Um, one, one of the challenges we have, frankly, with that, um, with understanding that today is the disclosure of the composition of the board. We've made a lot of progress, boards have made a lot of, lot of progress over the last couple of years on uh, broadening skills matrices uh, that go to professional background and, and experience, um, but it's still very difficult for us to understand the breadth of other, other personal characteristic diversity on, on the board today. So one of the things as we're talking to companies, we're looking for more disclosure to help tell that story and understand its alignment with, with that long-term strategy. So um, first and foremost, con continued focus on the board and then um, broadening, our, uh, broadening some of our focus there to include more holistic diversity. The second area um, that, that we've talked about a lot over the last, last several years is a growing focus on the board's role in overseeing strategy and risk. Um, you know, understanding, given the company's strategy, what the most material risks they either create or face are, and then how those risks are disclosed to the market so that the market can respond from a valuation standpoint. Um, just like Commissioner Jackson's focus on uh, disclosure of cybersecurity events so that the market can respond from a valuation standpoint, thinking across a broader range of risks, uh, making sure that there is an articulation of those risks on a company-by-company on -company basis, not looking for a one-size-fits-all approach, not looking for the boilerplate <coughs> approach, but really trying to make sure that uh, there's, there's a broad range of, of material, decision-useful risk disclosure that is consistent and comparable uh, so that those of us on the investor side can evaluate it over time. So that's the second area we're focusing on. And then two other areas that, that have also been part of the discussion over time and continue to be, one is the alignment of executive compensation with relative performance, ensuring that there's a linkage uh, between the company's performance and executive's compensation and making sure that the best performers are the best paid and, and the vice ver and the opposite is not true, um, that the, the worst performers are not the best paid. Um, and then finally, and this is an area where f for a variety of reasons that the governance ecosystem, if you will, has continued to evolve. And this is a focus on the rights, uh, the rights of shareholders, really governance structure, ensuring that you know those, those of us who own who have ownership positions in companies have an appropriate voice and vote to affect change over time. There's been a lot of evolution um, in, those, in those shareholder rights over the last couple of decades. There's still room to go. We've made a lot of progress, but that's still an area, still an area of focus for us. So th those are the things that we focused on in the past. We will continue to focus on in the future in the way, the way that some of them have and will continue to evolve. Thank you. Alicia. Thanks. Um, so I just wanted to let the group know, and you can say you heard it here first, um, that uh, corporate governance at CalSTRS is being renamed. We're now the uh, Sustainable Investments and Stewardship Strategies Group. I know that's a mouthful. Um, but it's basically to describe or better articulate everything that the group I work with does for the, the teachers of California. <laughs> Because although we're known for a lot of our stewardship activities, including the engagement and proxy voting, we spend a lot of time also managing a portfolio um, within my group. And, and a lot of that's focused on some of our ESG managers and our low carbon um, portfolio that we're responsible for, 
Uh, so we just do a lot of different activities. So from here forward. <laughs> but that sort of leads to um, the priorities for CalSTRS. And I really want to quote, because I think it's a really important one, and Glenn brought it up, and um, I want to quote what Commissioner Jackson said, because I think it's really important. And what he said about, and I wrote this down, you know, we owe society a better response to sustainability risk than boilerplate language. I think that's really, really relevant and important. And it sort of, it leads me to our first priority, which is, you know, how CalSTRS and how we're positioning our portfolio for a transition to what we would call a low carbon economy. You know, we, we are a 20, $225 billion fund for the teachers of California, like Glenn and, and some of my fellow panelists. You know, we consider ourselves permanent owners for the teachers of California. Um, we are their only source of retirement. I don't know if everybody knows this, but teachers in California don't get Social Security. So we need to make sure that we're, they have a safe and secure um, retirement, and we make sure that we're trying to make sure that portfolio is there to fund that. And so we spend a lot of time right now um, thinking about and engaging the big carbon emitters in our portfolio. And we know it's not our job to tell them how to run their businesses, but we're asking a lot of hard questions about risk. You know, we're asking, you know, where are there sort of, if you look at a heat map, you know, where, where are the risks to their assets? Um, what are they disclosing to the current shareholders um, and investors? And how are they thinking about these things as we move forward? And it's not just about what's happening next quarter or even in 2019. It's what are you doing, you know, and how is your business going to look five years, 10 years, 15 years from now? So that's the first one. Um, the second one, very similar to what Glenn was saying, is board structure. You know, do we have the right people sitting inside the boardroom, and how do they carry out the strategy going forward? Um, this leads, obviously, into very important things around diversity. Um, bringing it back to the Teachers of California again, our beneficiaries are 70% female. So this is something that they care very deeply about, and I think it's important um, that we have you know, visible diversity. And what I mean by that is because we're, we're in a time where there's a war on talent, there's a war to get, to attract and retain individuals, and if people can't see themselves in the upper ranks of your corporations, they're going to go elsewhere where they can. And I think that it's also relevant that in California, um, they recently passed the law that said that companies that do not have um, at least one female on their board, there will be consequences, financial consequences now for these types of firms. And I probably have said many times before, two or three years ago, that there'll never be quotas in the United States. Well, here we are. <laughs> they proved me wrong. There are, there are quotas, and, and we've had a long dialogue with a lot of California companies about this. And the good thing is um, it's actually causing companies to sort of uh, move faster in terms of trying to, to recruit new board members because I think most people are starting to recognize that it's not just enough to have one female on the board. You need to have more and you need to think about new ways to recruit and you need to think about what are the qualifications for directors and you have to think about expanding the board size because um, I think that's good for refreshment processes. I also think that um, the low turnover is also kind of a major obstacle that we're facing right now in terms of increasing that diversity, not just from a gender aspect, but from, from um, age and ethnicity and background. Uh, so that's our second sort of uh, pillar of priority. And then um, last but not least, and these are things that have all been talked about, is these fundamental governance issues. Um, back to what, you know, to echo what Glenn was saying, executive compensation is still a really important part of our engagement and our stewardship activities. One, we see executive comp as sort of our window inside the boardroom. It tells us a lot about how companies think about succession planning. It tells us how they're strategizing um, over the near and long term. Um, it tells us about, you know, how you're managing 
your human capital. You know, how do you think about the dynamic between how executives are paid and how your rank and file are paid? So we're, we're still going to spend a lot of time on that. And then, you know, this dual class issue. I think it's a really, really scary thing to think that in a governance world where you have this sort of principal agent issue and the lack of accountability that is set up when you do these dual class structures. And last but not least is I think there's been a lot of attention on these dual class issues. I think we also need to focus on some of these supermajority provisions that are in bylaws. We've all been talking about lately about how there are ways to um, sunset dual class or, you know, go to a, you know, a, a system where your board is elected annually, getting rid of, of classified board structures. Um, all these things are an evolution and I think companies need to look at, you know, where they are in the life cycle of their company and what are the right governance structures for that point in time. And these supermajority provisions handcuff the board and executives to things that may be antiqu antiquated for their company. And I think that, you know, Lyft is a perfect example where it's gotten all this attention about the dual class structure, but if you dig deep in that, in that S1, they also have supermajority provisions, which they're going, they're basically said they're going to go to, to market with a classified board structure. With the supermajority provisions, you would never be able to get rid of the, of the classified board structure. So, I mean, it's, it's sort of um, setting it up where it's just, you, there's never can be any change. And I don't think that's good for the marketplace or any company. Okay, that's it. Those are my three. <laughs> Eric. Great, thank you. I think we spent a lot of time thinking about how companies govern themselves, and I think this year has been quite reflective at BlackRock. Um, uh, by way of background, as, as Charles uh, shared, I, I have a, a unique lens into how governance works at, at advisory firms. I've worked at ISS, I've used Glass Lewis, I've voted on, on Viewpoint and Proxy Exchange, I've filed shareholder proposals previously. Um, and so, uh, and, and done ESG integration as well at, at New York Common. Um, so I think it's all of these experiences have really informed uh, my thinking on, on, on governance. And what's really started to happen, I think, in the last several years at BlackRock is there's been a lot of introspection in terms of how we're, we're, we're thinking about are we doing the governance work well and effectively? Um, and I th one of the first things I worked on uh, when I joined the, the firm was to develop engagement priorities for, for, for BlackRock. And I think that, that we really needed to do a better job articulating to the boards, to the management teams that we were engaging with, uh, what our thinking was. And, and I'll share a few of those in, in a few minutes. Uh, just by background, the other thing that, that, that's important to understand is that, that the team is not based on I mean, we, We're, we're going to talk a lot, a lot about U.S issues here, but the team is, is based globally in seven offices. Um, it's a function that we've had for over 20 years now. In fact, I just learned recently we've had someone on the team for 23 years. Um, so it's, it's a global team. There's, there's a lot of experience on the team, um, and, and we want to be local. In Japan, we want to talk in Japanese to companies. We want to understand labor shortages in Japan. Um, so that's, I think, a, you know, an example of really are we doing governance effectively and appropriately? And I think an, another interesting uh, thought around governance is that there's so much emphasis on, on proxy voting and, and how you're casting your votes, but really from for BlackRock's perspective, it's, it's about engagement first, and it's really that feedback mechanism, that, that loop that allows us to understand a company's approach to strategy, diversity, board quality, uh, board accountability. Um, environmental risks and opportunities and human capital management, uh, as Aisha was, was mentioning, it's, it's really having that, that engagement first approach. We're not simply going to, to be casting votes against on, on particular issues unless we really have an opportunity to, to understand a company's direction and perspective on, on these issues. Um, so I, I think that the, the, you know, the signal for, for effective governance is, is really not the measure of uh, whether or not you're filing a shareholder proposal or, or supporting sh more shareholder proposals than others, and I think often that is a measure, uh, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's, 
it's myopic in, in the scope of what really I think effective governance is, having been on, on many sides of this. Um, to, to delve into, uh, and just, just for backdrop, for those who, who don't know, we've in, we engage about 2,000 companies annually in 34 countries, um, and, and it's on, on a wide range of issues. Um, you know, governance, as uh, Indra pointed out earlier, is, is really about board, uh, the, the, the caliber of the board from, from our perspective. It's about composition, effectiveness, um, access to independent, independent directors is critically important for us, particularly if it's an issue that we're, we're, we're challenged with. Um, and we seek really clear disclosure around director responsibilities um, and commitments. Uh, we really want to understand when we're talking to governance uh, committee members, for example, Steve, is around the, the process for, for uh, uh, turnover, secession planning, um, and, and diversity as well. And diversity, is, as Glenn referenced uh, earlier, it's not just personal characteristics from our perspective, uh, but it's, it's also around uh, professional skill sets. Um, we use gender diversity as a signal in terms of, of uh, board effectiveness. Uh, it's readily identifiable. Um, but it's uh, certainly not the sole measure from, from BlackRock's perspective on, on uh, diversity. Um, our, we've evolved some of our uh, priorities this year. As, as you, some of you may know, uh, this past year, uh, last year, our priority around environmental issues was climate risk, and it still remains a, an important consideration for, for BlackRock. But we've expanded that priority to environmental risks and opportunities. And when we did some looking at the types of topics that we were covering, it was really around waste management. It was around resource, nat natural resource uh, uh, management, and all sorts of risks and opportunities. And we really uh, talked about so many opportunities. A good example in Japan, again, when we were talking to, to uh, automobile makers, it's, it's around EV penetration. Are you, uh, are you adopting these technologies? How, how quickly, how readily? Uh, so it's really not just around uh, climate risk because uh, there's, uh, you know, obviously a, a ton of emphasis here in the U.S. around shareholder proposals that that series helps to, to, to organize. Um, but it's, it's really around a much broader set of operational, material operational uh, sustainability factors. Um, so those, those are, I think, a, just a quick summary of, of the things that we're thinking about. And I'll pass it over to Steve. How do you react to all this, Steve, from a, <clears throat> a director's executive role? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, thank you for inviting me back, Charles. I think I was trying to remember the date of, our, of the first one of these that I attended, um, but uh, it was a long time ago, nearly 20 years ago, and I was on a, this panel with right. Ralph Whit Whitworth and uh, Nell Menno, Damon Silvers uh, in that era. That's right. And, um, and Charles, uh, was, I, I think you were governance chair on, uh, on our AutoZone board, and yeah. I was a, a relatively new CEO. And we were working for the first time, and, and I turned to Charles and I said, Charles, we really need some sort of statement about, you know, how we want the board to operate. Um, and at, in those days, there was no such thing as corporate governance, uh, uh, corporate governance principles within a company. And so, we sat down and, uh, and we looked around for, uh, for models. We couldn't find any. So I, I, we drafted some of the very first corporate governance principles. People have said they were the first. I can't verify that, but they were some of the first. And then um, I became the uh, business roundtable governance chair, and we took those um, principles that, that we had drafted at AutoZone, and that, they became the basis for the business roundtable's uh, first corporate governance principles. So this goes back a, a very long period of time. The only reason I tell that story is, is not to show how old Charles is, but to, um, uh, but to say that, you know, in a very short period of time, 20 years is actually a very short period of time, we've gone from not having any such thing as corporate governance principles to everything that we have today, which is um, nearly an industry at this, but more importantly, I think a sea change of, of, uh, of, of change, I guess, a sea change of, in corporate governance over the past 20 years. And I'm, I'm actually very proud of it because it, it hasn't been, yes, there's a whole community and, you know, we all are part of this community. I consider myself uh, a long-term participant in this, but it's been because of corporate leaders like Indra and the work that we did early 
that has led to this change. The corporations themselves have made the change. And yeah, we've got the issues. I think, you know, listening to Aisha talk about, you know, um, classified boards and, and some of these issues, I'm still astounded, you know, I just, you know, how can we still have some of these things hanging out there? But, um, but I am proud of, of, of how far we've gone. I think today's world is very different. You know, in those days, um, you know, the shareholders were largely uh, big component, which, which were individual shareholders, 40 percent, and then the rest institutional, but they were, they were really uh, split up more. Now we have a large, much larger concentration, and, and um, not to argue that the con concentration is good or bad, but, but the concentration is in long-term shareholders. I think um, each, of, uh, each of these have referred to themselves as permanent. I think that's a great thing. I think it's great for our economy. I think it's great for our country, and I think it's great for the American corporation because I think that that, for the first time, partners the investor with the management team and the boards. When, when I was asked as a CEO um, for many years, you, you know, what my time frame was, at, at the same time that, that boards and, and CEOs were being criticized for being too short term, I would say my, my time horizon is forever. I have to run this corporation forever. And, and my, my biggest challenge was trying to figure out, trying to get people onto a common time frame. So I had you know, a certain group that wanted to maximize their investment in the next 90 days, some within the next 180 days. You know, it was all of these, these end dates. And, and I found myself having meeting after meeting with investors you know, that were simply trying to time the market and decide when to sell, rather than the kinds of issues that you hear about talking here. So this is very gratifying. Um, I'll say one more thing and then I'll, I'll yield. Um, the, I think the, the debate and I think the question that was asked about socialism was, um, was a very good question. I think the discussion today that we're having is about what is the role of the corporation in today's society. And when I went to business school, we were taught that the only role that we played in management was to maximize shareholder returns. Uh, quote, unquote, three words, that's all we had to remember. Um, in fact, it's incorrect, and I had to learn this through my, you know, um, many, many years as a CEO. And I used to remember my constituents by my title, CEO, customers, employees, and owners. And then I would append community environment. But the point is that it, it is a multiple constituency world, and I think that the role of management and the role of boards today is to try to essentially create an optimization equation, if, if there are mathematicians in the crowd. But it's how do you optimize the performance and the activities of a, of a corporation such that it optimizes across all of those constituents? I mean, simply, if you ran the company strictly for, uh, for shareholders, you know, short-term return, you know, forget about the customer, forget about the employees, it would lead to all sorts of bad behavior. If you ran it strictly for the employees, you'd pay them whatever they want, forget about <laughs> returns and all of that. And you can see how you know, any one extreme leads to silliness, but, but the point is to balance all of these. And I think this is where we're at, and I think it's really interesting to hear this, but, but I would finally say that, that I think that this, this, um, this long-term focus is relatively new, and it's, and it's gratified, but I think it's stratified. We, we still are dealing with a stratified environment. We, it, it's bifurcated into permanent owners and then activism, which there's a lot of great stuff, but there's also still some of this, this very short-term activity. And I think, I think the more that we can drive to consensus across the, the share-owning community and the management and boards as to what's the time frame, what's the role, I think then we can, we can uh, develop strategies together and I think uh, lead to the best production of not only shareholder value but long-term growth, long-term innovation, and and really the right thing for our country. So let me, let me stop there, but uh, happy to come back on any one of these. Chief Justice Steele, you're always the cleanup guy. I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not sure how to take that. I, <laughs> and positively. I showered this morning before I came to the meeting. Uh, just a couple of comments before my substantive comments. First, I was somewhat amused when Charles was referred to as old. <laughs> Charles clerked for the Fourth Circuit for a judge that was in my class of law school. I must be adding age diversity to this panel in a genuine, <laughs> serious way. The second thing is, would the person who told the commissioner that someone 
commented about the SEC's unwelcome arrival. Please stand up so I can recognize them for the rest of my career. <laughs> no? Okay. I, I thought I might be worth my while to find out who did that. Uh, what, what I'd like to talk about is something that I have come to believe relatively recently to be extremely important, not just to governance, but to the marketplace generally, and that's the concept of ESG. Now, I recognize that there's a debate even on what the S means in ESG. Is it environmental, social, and governance issues? Is it environmental sustainability and governance issues? And what do all three of those terms really mean? I was enlightened first by Larry Fink's, I think now famous letter about the importance of focusing on ESG issues. And then perhaps even more so by what I think is mandatory reading if I were teaching this as a class on ESG, which I'm not really qualified to do, Marty Lipton's article, The New Paradigm. Both are readily available on the internet, and I commend any of you who have an interest in this concept of ESG and how it may reformalize the relationship between boards, the market, and stockholders, to start off, if you haven't already read them, with those two articles. It, the second, uh, Marty Lipton's new paradigm suggests two things. One, that paying attention to ESG issues is a function of recognizing that short-termism is an evil and long-term investment is a good. Now, that's pretty stark and it's my characterization. Marty might not agree with that. And frankly, I'm closer to Marty's age than I am to Charles, so I can call him Marty. I don't think he'd be offended. But the concept that he discusses suggested in his paper that Delaware should take some action under the traditional theory, if Delaware doesn't act, then the federal government will, and we all know that means the barn's on fire, if not the homestead. I suggest to you, point number one, Delaware law is very clear that if boards in a thoughtful way address issues that they believe are in the long-term interest of the corporation and its owners, and they do so with care, they do so by following their fiduciary duty of care, then that judgment, well documented, will not run afoul of their fiduciary duty under any hindsight review by the Delaware court system. So I suggest that the rush should not be to legislate or regulate. The rush should be to recognize that these are important issues that must be dealt with, and that if a board does so in a thoughtful way, the Delaware courts, at least, will not interfere with that business judgment level review. Why is it important to address these issues? Point two, when investors show an interest in ESG, they're going to move their capital ultimately where the board and the company shows an interest in ESG. Therefore, from the purely, I think, practical standpoint, Boards at least have to start seriously addressing what in all of the issues that may be encompassed by the three-word term or the acronym. It'll draw investment. I think the Larry Fink letter points that out, that thoughtful investors are interested in these issues and companies that respond favorably and show a thoughtful response will be more likely to acquire capital than others. That just makes market sense to me and it's important. This, the second issue is we heard in those marvelous presentations earlier today, we heard the commissioner make his comments about accountability and responsibility in the, in the workplace and in the community. It's important for companies to recognize that the focus that the corporation has today may not be on redistribution of wealth may not be on necessarily executive compensation versus that of the employee, but it definitely needs to be focused on the environmental risk by not addressing environmental issues in a way that investors and other commentators like the Academy will think is important. And that's a good investment of time and resources to address environmental issues within the company if from no other direction than the risk that your operations pose to the community and 
the country, and maybe even in some in instances, the world at large. The, how do we encourage companies from the perspective of the law if I have just said regulation and regulate, regulation and statutory changes are not necessary? Well, in Delaware, with the benefit corporations, we gave an opportunity for people to check with transparency what companies were taking what steps to address the issues that were appropriate for a benefit corporation. It may be worthwhile in Delaware to suggest this kind of a transparency for all Delaware corporations, all Delaware corp chartered corporations, by legislating that they should at least report as a part of their duty of disclosure or duty of candor to the investment community the extent to which they are contemplating addressing these issues, how they're doing it, and give them an opportunity to register as a corporation that is doing that very thing and a focus website otherwise, maybe even a central place within the state archives for them to have a reporting system so investors get a better handle on what they're doing. Of course, there will be some fear by some old school folks that this sets you up for a breach of fiduciary duty claim if you don't follow through. And now, as a returned litigator, I'm never upset when somebody is sued for breach of fiduciary duty. I think it's a cleansing operation, and I don't say that from the fact that it benefits the lawyers. I think it's a form of accountability that's been successful over time, as well if not better than any other, because I've come to realize that corporate directors and CEOs are as interested in reputational damage as they are in whether or not D&O insurance covers their mistakes. It's hugely important. So maybe that's a mechanism that would incentivize corporations to talk to the investment community and say, we have an, our understanding of what ESG responsibility and therefore accountability means, and here it is for you to look at. You assess it, and you can decide whether to invest in us or not, you can decide whether to sell your investment in us. You can conclude whether what we're doing maximizes long-term investment, long-term success, or short-term success. I don't think there's a bright line necessarily between the two, but there has to be, I think, a more meaningful engagement and exchange about what the corporation is doing with the investment community. Disclosure typically allows people to make reasoned judgments without disclosure, without material information. You can't make a reasoned judgment. You can just make, to use the colloquialism, an educated guess. And I think this type of regime, I would suggest, is something to at least talk about. I don't pretend to have the answers to these issues. I, I have always been skeptical of change, but I'm captivated by the concept of ESG and how it can be integrated into both governance and to investment. And I look forward to far more thoughtful minds than mine to write about it, gather empirical data to support or reject parts of it, to show how it can enhance long-term value, attract investors, and do the right thing for the local community and for the nation and even the globe. Thank you. Uh, well, now we'll go into it. There's so many good points that have been raised. I, I, I don't even know where to start. But I'd, I'd like to ask Steve a quick one because, and then, because it, I thought it was interesting. We talked about and I, what you sort of presented was the old, basic, not the old, it's the constituency model of the corporation. The corporation is made up of various constituents, one of which happens to be the shareholder. Isn't uh, shareholder, a shareholder value ethos, where the shareholder value is prime, the prime raison d'etre of the corporation, given long-term permanent owners, isn't uh, the, the taking care of the other constituencies always baked in to a, a, a shareholder primacy model? In other words, if you're going to return value to the maximum value to the investors over the long term, aren't you going to have to think carefully about the other constituencies, or as, as the Chief Justice has pointed out, ESG. I mean, it's all baked in. In other words, is it necessary to change the primacy model to a, to a multi-model, which destroys accountability in my view, but within the primacy model, it's always, you're always thinking about it. You have to. Uh, 
No, I, you know, I, I think that's right. I think Milton Friedman's been um, misquoted, or his quote has been uh, misunderstood on this, where he said that the, that the, uh, the shareholder is, is all you need to, to, to deal with. It, what, what you're, the way you're saying it, though, um, I think is a multi-constituency approach. In other words, you don't just do it in a vacuum. The problem is if, if the interpretation of you know, uh, shareholder primacy is that nothing else matters, you know, then, then we should just go ahead and pollute. We should just go ahead and you know, emit carbon. Uh, you know, diversity, who cares? You know, so my, my only point in saying that, that there are multiple constituencies is to recognize that it's a balance and all of these things come together to produce shareholder value. It's not an either or. And, and I think that's where I, you know, some of my compatriots have, been, uh, have gone astray. You know, I, I think, I'll say one more thing. I think this whole system that we have before us in capitalism is flawed. But it's the, it's the greatest system ever known to mankind. I'll echo Indra on that. It has lifted more people out of poverty. It's driven, you know, all the wealth creation in the world. It, but it, it, but it, it comes back to trust every single time. And the reason that I have and, and others have embraced all of these changes that we're talking about over the past 20 years in corporate governance is because the trust in the markets is so important. If we don't trust what's going on in the markets, then we can't have efficient and effective markets. And it's up to us as corporate leaders and board members to make sure that that trust is, uh, is well placed. And so therefore, it's not in anyone's best interest to have bad actors or have these things go off, uh, off the rails. And, I, and that is why the business community has stepped up. We've embraced Sarbanes-Oxley. We, we've embraced um, Dodd-Frank. We've embraced all of the corporate governance changes, because, n not because we loved every single little you know, p p piece of it, but it, as a whole, it was absolutely necessary coming out of the corporate scandal age to, to re-engender trust uh, in the business community. And that's what we are today as stewards of trust in our economy. Uh, I'll come back to Earth for uh, the next uh, question. Uh, everyone mentioned sustainability. Uh, you know, the issue of ESG sustainability, we invest long term, we assess for sustainable corporations. And the thing that I find tough, and this is, I'd like to hear from the, uh, our, our investors here, is that you vote, and you vote, you, you're going to vote on the basis of, of sustainability. How in the world do you measure it? And in other words, a consistent voting standard, an appropriate voting standard, is based on a consistent standard of review. You know, when you vote on governance issues, you either have a stagger board or you don't. You've got term limits or you don't. You have a diverse board or you don't. Sustainability is more often in the eyes of the beholder, to what one person may be sustainable, someone's not. And when you are investing, other people's money, who also have probably very different views of what it is or what it isn't, how do you how do you a come up with a an appropriate standard that you can measure a board by to support or not support? And number two, how do you take into account that your own investors who supply you capital probably have differing views on it? How do you reach a common consensus, if you will, amongst your investors? Start, Glenn, Glenn, you're saying, and we'll work our way down. Yeah. No, I, I think, you know, what, what's important <clears throat> context for us is when we think about sustainability, it's about sustainable value creation for the clients who have entrusted their assets to us, right? So we have 20 million clients around the world who, who have given us five and a half trillion of their money to invest for long-term liabilities they have, like saving for a home or education or retirement. And... Um, that's the thing they have in common. They've entrusted us to, to track a particular index or a particular investment objective. We know that they exist at every point on the ideological spectrum on, on a lot of these issues. But the thing they have in common is um, the entrusting of their assets to us for, for long-term value creation. So that's the hook for us. So when we think about you know, things like ESG, um, you know, for us, we, we start with the G. Right? We're really focused on how companies are governing the exposure to all of the risks they face or create, whether they're environmental or social risks um, or, or any other risks to, their, to the sustainability of that long-term value they create um, for their shareholders, but also for other constituencies. You know, I think particularly given our, the, the practically permanent 
extent of our ownership and that, that long-term focus, over, over an extended period of time, the interests of all of those constituencies are going to converge, right? So you can't, you can't have a sustainable business that doesn't take into account your human capital management or doesn't take into account the significant material risk, or I'm sorry, the significant environmental or social risks that you may face or create. So it's not an either or, it's really an and in terms of addressing the interests of all of those constituencies over time in a way that both maximizes value for shareholders but those other constituencies. So it's, you know, when we think about sustainability, it's not a, it's, it's not an agenda we have on an environmental or social perspective. It really comes back to the value of those assets that our clients have entrusted to us and sustaining that over over the extent of their, their investment with us. Asia. So for us at, at CalSTRS, you know, the vote is just one tiny piece of all of our stewardship activities. And so, you know, on specifically, if we're looking to vote on a particular, you know, shareholder proposal that may be addressing an environmental issue, that's one where we look at these on a case-by-case -case basis. You know, what, what is the company already disclosing? Um, what efforts have they made? You know, is it just boilerplate risk? Or are they really talking about um, what can affect their company and their strategy over the long term? And, you know, I talked about at the beginning, you know, how, how are we going to position this portfolio over the long term if we're transitioning to a low carbon uh, economy. I look at our top 10 holdings and it looks nothing like what our top 10 holdings were just 10 years ago. And that is such a short period of time. And I think it's important to understand, you know, how that change has happened because we want to make sure that these companies are sustainable over the very long term and how they're managing those risks are just as important as how they're, you know, sort of creating value. Yeah, I mean, from, from BlackRock's perspective, it's certainly not BlackRock to uh, position to prescribe what is material in terms of ESG risk. I mean, we, when we engage with the companies, it's, it's really to understand what the company has uh, determined to be uh, sustainability uh, materials from a sustainability standpoint and how that really feeds into the corporate strategy. We uh, had an engagement, uh, obviously we keep our engagements private, uh, but we did have an engagement uh, in, in the past year where it was it was quite interesting. The, the There was a pretty spoke, in, in, in a wheel and the spokes, and one of the spokes was sustainability risks. And uh, we, we spoke to the company about that. We said, well, you know, who on the board oversees that? And it pointed us to the, to the skills matrix and, and, and said, well, these, these folks over here. And then we said, well, well what's their understanding of sustainability and, and what's their experience? And if that's their, it's your skills matrix. And, um, and so we'll, we'll get back to you on that. Um, so it's, it's, it's really interesting. What, and I think the reason why that's instructive is because I think the genesis for sustainability reporting started you know, 2003, 2004 with the GRI, and, and it's since, uh, you know, and, and, and so much of it, I think, was detached from corporate strategy at, at that time, and those functions are still embedded within corporations, and, and those, those departments don't, uh, don't really, th those metrics don't always get reviewed by the board. We actually, in that engagement, said, well, what four or five metrics is the board reviewing? Um, and in fact, it was a, a governance committee, nominating committee that oversaw the sustainability factors. Um, and so well, what do they care about? What are the things that w keep them up at night? Again, BlackRock not saying that these are the things that we think you should be reporting on. So we just want to hear, we want to understand. And I think that dialogue and that exchange, I think, uh, was, a, a, as I mentioned earlier, a feedback loop to say, are you, is your board actually thinking about those metrics? And, and we talked about SASB, of course, being a really useful uh, instrument in identifying those 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 uh, uh, tools. I mean, I, I use that material materiality map all the time, um, and 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 in helping to lead engagements and, and lead the conversation. Steve Myron, just a couple of comments that may not directly address your question, Charles, but. I was 
intrigued by the reference to Milton Friedman because in Marty Lipton's article, The New Paradigm, he talks about how Milton Friedman's view of the world is no longer relevant, that the focus now is on long-termism and maximizing shareholder wealth is not the name of the game today. One of the points I want to make in addition to the one I did earlier about the Delaware scheme, it was pointed out to me last week at Tulane when I was on an ESG panel that there are several Delaware cases that talk about maximizing shareholder wealth and that the focus of directors should be on the corporation and the economic interests of the stockholders. And we engaged in a discussion about, well, what Delaware cases in the absence of a cash for stock merger sale of the company, the focus is on stockholder value. I think that way of phrasing it better encapsulates the idea of ESG and how it relates to fiduciary duty and how it can be developed. I don't think the Delaware case law supports a view that it's a breach of fiduciary duty not to make every decision one that enhances stockholder wealth at that moment. That's not the case. Enhancing stockholder value is what's, I think, the typical norm from the Delaware cases. So again, I don't think there has to be some revolutionary change in the Delaware case law or the Delaware common law with respect to fiduciary duty to allow explorative opportun exploratory opportunities with ESG. I think that's important to recognize that the Delaware court system is not a barrier to ESG principles in the boardroom, and that's another reason that they should be explored and empirical evidence obtained to tell you in which direction is the way to go. And the great evil in my mind, this I can't be on a panel without reminding myself of this if no one else, those who know me are probably tired of hearing it, but the great evil is to have some regime from D.C. <laughs> imposed upon all U.S. chartered corporations as if they were all the same and that one size fits all and everything's going to work the same for everyone else. That we should try to avoid at all costs, despite the fact it's already, unfortunately, on the horizon. But what do you expect a year before an election? We, um, we talked about dual class, or obviously the commissioner and I talked about it, and it was brought up on this panel, the problems of dual class. It's been discussed in this panel uh, for years. What is the, now I'm interested from the investment side, investor side, because it, what, what you heard from Rob Jackson was the approach that a lot of the institutions have been taking on sort of laying it at the, the foot of the, in, let the indexes remove, let, let the indexes remove the shares from the index, we don't have to own it, and that may be the appropriate way of dealing with it. Not, we're not going to buy it, we won't buy it if it's not an index, the indexes take care of it. His response was that maybe not such a good idea because sometimes a value stock may have, uh, you know, you, by taking it out of the index, you may lose returns. The bigger question for y'all is if that index isn't the appropriate approach and the SEC legally can't, should there be a state law response, whether limiting the, limiting the use of it entirely or simply lit it, limiting the term of, the, of it entirely? And I go to y'all because ultimately it's going to be pressure or reaction from the investors that ultimately push a Delaware or the Model Act, a, 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 a general state corporation law, to change. And should it? I mean, I, I like the answer, the saying, well, the easiest thing is to do nothing, and you have to do more than nothing. What are you going to do about it? Who wants it to jump in? Do you want me to jump in? Because yeah. I have very strong views about this. Um, one, I. I think that, Steve, you brought up a really good point about trust at the corporation. And I think that, that it's, it's trust and accountability. You know, we have this system of governance where, um, you know, whenever I try to explain governance to, to our interns or, or um, you know, people that are less sort of knowledgeable, it's, it's, you know, there's these three parties. There's the executive management or the company, there's the board, and there's the shareholders and the stakeholders. And governance is about that ecosystem and how they all work together. And if you have a situation like a dual class structure or the supermajority provisions or anything that sort of insulates that board from accountability, I think it's a really, really scary thing. I mean, I look at, and this is not to throw you know Facebook under the bus or anything, but 
They're a top 10 holding for us. And you have a company where that concentration of power is on one person. And, they, they and he controls billions of dollars and social media and all this other things. I mean, that's scary to me. And the fact that there's no accountability there is quite frankly quite dangerous. Um, so I don't know what the solution is, but I think that investors have to start really speaking up about this I'm going to do a quick plug for the Investor Stewardship Group. I know it was, it was mentioned earlier, but the Investor Stewardship Group, you know, over $30 trillion, and my partners here on the, um, on the panel are also part of this, and we set up these sort of principles of things that we all agree on. And so that's why companies can't say, oh, well, you're the first shareholder that ever brought up that our directors should be elected by majority vote. I mean, they can't say that anymore because we have all of these – um, investors, you know, pushing for sort of a set standard of governance um, in in this country, quite frankly, and and we're having um, a our first inaugural ISG will um, conference will be here in, in September, and so I hope you all will come. But putting that aside, that goes back to I don't know what the solution is, but investors really have to start speaking up about these things. Yeah, Glenn. So, uh, from BlackRock's perspective, I think we, we, we set out our, our, pers our thinking on, on dual class uh, shares in a consultation in April 2018 um, uh, with regards to MSCI's um, uh, thinking of removing certain companies from, from, from their benchmark indices. Um, we certainly agree with, the, with a lot of what Rob Jackson shared earlier. Uh, sunset provisions uh, make, uh, make a, lo a lot of sense. But I think it's a multi-pronged solution, um, and we shared that as well in, in, in the letter, that it's similar to, to uh, you know, you want to buy a, a values-based uh, uh, ESG fund. I mean, uh, an index provider could pr create a, a, um, a governance uh, index and allow that to, 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 to be a solution. We talk about that in, in the letter as well. So I think, you know, what engaging, uh, seeking uh, uh, sunset provisions, and also having indices uh, create uh, you know, go governance uh, indices uh, with. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think that goes back to sort of the evolution of governance and things that weren't common practice 10 years ago that are, are, are no longer, you know, in practice today. And you have you sunset is sort of a good example of how we've evolved our thinking about these things but there has to be ways to allow those governance structures and those checks and balances to evolve over time and when you set up a dual class without a sunset it's it's in perpetuity and th and there's no way to sort of unwind those things and lots of companies have demonstrated that they could do that forever well and again that's the legal Glenn? Yeah, I mean, not a whole lot to add here, but I, I think, you know, over time having more consistency between um, economic exposure and, and voting, voting influence, I think, I think is an important direction. At the same time, um, you know, one of the things we don't want is to exclude mainstream investors from access to public companies. So things like excluding, excluding dual class shares from indexes, we think uh, ma for mainstream indexes would, would remove, those, remove those assets from the pool of many, many investors. So I think directionally um, we're, we're supportive of having more synchronicity over time, but I think excluding, excluding regular investors' access to those public companies very early in their, uh, early in their listing cycle doesn't, doesn't serve long-term long -term investor interests well. Of course, the danger with those companies is long term. You're all dependent on the genius, and the genius, if the genius loses the genius, there's absolutely nothing about it. And uh, or as we saw in the CBS Viacom saga this past year, that's the sort of thing that ultimately results, and the investors are left in the balconies. It's a theater company, <laughs> movie company. We're left in the balcony, so to speak, with absolutely not with, with the greatest at stake. That's the issue that the the capital in these companies are really held by you, the public, the public funds. Uh, however, the control rests in the hands of one or two people. 
And without accountability, bad things happen. And ultimately, it's true, if you keep them out of the index, you do miss the pop. On the other hand, you'll probably also miss the collapse <laughs> when they, they mess up. And so, but the question is, is the form itself valid in a public company? In a private company, different story. But in a publicly traded company, when you go to the public for capital, is the form it per se problematic? And, and some will, you know, will argue long-term, you know, long-termism, but the trade-off on accountability and the issues that have seemed to come out of these things are really very troubling, I think. But, Myron, you're about to... <coughs> I don't know that <clears throat> I may be the only one in the room that sees some irony to this. Uh, <laughs> why are you investing in a dual-stock company if you believe it's the wrong governance scheme? And the answer is because it's profitable for you to invest in that company. And when you ask the question, what are we going to do about this? Who's we? Caesar Augustus? Uh, <laughs> you just don't invest if you don't like that option. And it, it doesn't seem to me that it's, as Indra, if I can be so crass as to call her by her first name, said, I think appropriately, these are little republics, these corporations. That means you have a vote as a stockholder. It means that you don't invest in companies where you don't want to be associated with what you believe to be a perverse or a badly structured governance regime. What, who's government to come in and tell you? What, why should there be a statute passed to bar it? Well, why do we have to have government protect us from ourselves? We can make our reasoned judgment on our own. But that's the indice argument. Their, their argument is we have to because we, we invest through an index. And if it's in the index, that's why you heard here three years ago, take it out of the index. And then you take it out of the index, you create another problem. So the question is, it is a problematic form of capital formation. One answer is just don't buy it. Right. But if you invest on an index, you have to buy it. That's the index philosophy. You can't remove it. So take it out of the index. That creates the problem of, oh, you lose the benefit on the upside. Right. You also lose the benefit of the down. What, what, the question what? is, there are certain forms of, of, of organization, Martin, we don't allow for one reason or another. Isn't this one of them, partic particularly? It's not Caesar Augustus. It's, it's uh, you know, we have statutes on all kinds of ways of capital formation. Isn't this a form of for formation that ultimately causes more harm than benefit? And even if it, the argument is always, well, the investors, it's their money, their problem. Well, in these companies, you have no oversight, real oversight by the boards, right, because the boards themselves are accountable to the person who put them there even with fiduciary duty, and ultimately, if there's a problem, the, the oversight is transferred from the board to the public or to a regulator, to the, to the government itself, which we all pay for. So there is, a, it, it's, there is a cost of this thing long term, hence the CBS Viacom. We all ended up paying for that dispute, if you think about it. It wasn't just the shareholders, it was all of us got stuck in this, whether the courts having to try to resolve this thing. And that's, I think, the, the tougher, that's the tougher issue. I'm not arguing the, there is a solution. I just would, would hope that as a jurisdiction we think about it. And I would hope the investors, you know, are kind of stuck in this one too. <laughs> would think about it a little bit. But uh, before we go to the audience, let me ask one more thing. Uh, one more. We um, talked about uh, uh, diversity boards, term limits, uh, quotas, quote unquote. Isn't the idea of, wasn't the original idea of diversity on boards it, in the sense that if you limit the pool of people you draw from to serve as a director, and you're necessarily limiting the talent. And the broader the pool, the broader the talent you can attract. Because the idea, an investor wants talented oversight. And if you say only this class of people can you know, be on a board, then you've naturally limited the kind of talent you can bring in. Isn't the Calif or can the California be legislation in a weird way, go back to the Calisters, be read is effectively for a slot limiting the talent pool? Isn't it the same argument but on the flip side? And aren't you in that respect, in a way, harming shareholder value than increasing it than having an open pool for everyone? In other words, a talent pool that's open and picking directors based on the talent pool uh, that was diverse, as opposed to picking a, can a director who is diverse. Mm -hmm. Throw that out. No, I think that's a good point. I, I think it's one of the reasons when we engage with companies, 
about diversity on their board, we're specifically asking them to widen that pool of candidates. It's why we suggest in a lot of times that maybe expanding the board size um, is good for a variety of reasons. One, because of the low turnover, but also for succession planning purposes, it's great to have sort of, you know, expand the board to add a couple board members and then ask folks, you know, transition off the board. It's great to have that institutional memory on the board while you're, while you're onboarding new board members. Um, but that, this gap between sort of gender representation or female representation on boards and their role and our role in society, I mean, we have to close that gap. I think it's only like 18% right now. And so sometimes we're criticized at CalSTRS for focusing on gender diversity. Um, that's not that we don't care about the wider, um, broader definition of diversity, but it's something our beneficiaries care a lot about. And to me, it's, that, it's the biggest gap. And what we're trying to do is sort of shrink that gap. Because it's not just about, it, it isn't a, a, of course it is a value for us at CalSTRS, but we also think it's a value added proposition for the companies in which we invest. Yeah, I mean, I'd be really curious to know how many companies are quote unquote ensnared in in this quota in, in California. I mean, if you don't have a woman on your board, you're nominating <laughs> governance committee at the, in this day yeah. and age. Probably needs to think a little bit more more broadly. It was funny. So I I got a call about Amazon to bring in a new in the board, and they said, "Isn't it great?" That you know, this is Amazon has, is a diverse board, and I said I, I didn't I don't think of her that way. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I mean, I would love to have been new on. We we wanted to have her on our board. I mean, but it wasn't it wasn't the issue wasn't diversity. This was a v incredibly talented CEO. I mean, what yeah. and I and it, it was struck me sort of funny because I didn't I, and I thought would would that that wasn't the point of bringing someone like that. That caliber on your board, that's a talented individual. That's who you want on your board. Yeah, if, if, if I could comment, you know, we, we've done a lot of study on, on diversity on boards, and, you know, it, it amazes me that there's some correlation here to the same companies who have classified boards, dual share structures, have the least diversity on their boards as well, and it tends to skew towards the, the newer technology-oriented firms. Um, I, I think we've got an issue there. They're mostly centered in, in one state, um, in one region of one state, and so they're highly addressable. But uh, it's all the same group here, folks. Uh, but listen, I, I think, you know, we did a study at the conference board a few years ago uh, that said, uh, that it led to the creation of our campaign, which is every other one. That study suggested if you just replace every other director who is scheduled to retire in the next three years, so every other director, normal retirement in the next three years, you take it from 18 percent to 30 percent in three years of women on boards, minority on boards. If you solve for that over the long run, every other run, one, you get to 50 percent in, you know, certainly within a decade. So I, this is not hard. There is not a supply issue. Uh, it, it, unless you define it by a Fortune 500 female CEOs or diverse CEOs, if, if you remove that, there's not a supply issue. And of course, you, you know, there are there are just thousands and thousands of, of very qualified people. But why? What's the business case for doing it? Well, if if this group, if you think about uh, women in society, and, I, and let me just address women. You know, Taisha's point. Women. 75% of our economy is the consumer. Almost every consumer decision is made by, uh, by women or influenced by women. 90% of groceries, 65% um, of household, 75% uh, of autos, uh, majority of all investment decisions. You go on and on and on. The majority of people in the world are women. The majority of people in the United States are women. The majority of college graduates are women. Um, it, you, know, you, you, go, you go through every aspect of this. Every, you know, the majority of customers, majority of employees, majority of owners are women, and yet the minority of the people who represent the corporations that, do, that, that are serving these constituents, again, are not. So it's just, it's stupidity, because we're not accessing our human capital, we're not bringing in the knowledge and the, the wisdom of, of the diverse groups that can then help 
uh, in a corporation. So I think, it's, I think the business case is very, very clear, and, um, I, I, and it really isn't very hard. It just takes a determination. All right, let's go to the audience for questions. We're a little over, but we start a little late. We're going to try to run this to 1230. Uh, and by the way, we'll have a really good lunch outside. You'll bring it back in. And this lunch speaker is terrific, by the way, too. Uh, who would like to uh, ask a question of this erstwhile panel? Someone? All the way over there. Yes, sir. Way in the back. Yeah. One of the common uh, themes of this whole excellent conference has been the intersection between the robustness of enterprise risk management and, take put the, and the ESG lens. Um, I've spent a long career in, in, in several different companies where my observation was that internally risk management was not a robust process. And I was just you represent a variety of perspectives in that space. If we accept the premise that our ability to pursue long-term value creation is a function of the effectiveness of the way companies think about the risk, identify and manage those risks, um, I'm curious, and we talked about a couple of theories of why that's the case, legal, um, Com boilerplate uh, risk of, from a, uh, worries about uh, activists, et cetera. But it's a fascinating, just as commentary, there's a fascinating article in the paper the other day about PGE uh, P and, and sort of the, um, their failure to connect the dots between climate change and safety risks and, and the effectiveness and the, the, um, the robustness of their infrastructure. And, and those are, there are plenty of examples that I think are keeping companies from making that connection. I was just curious as your perspective, how do we get to the point where enterprise risk management effectiveness is a, a foundational core uh, competency of, of, of companies that you're going to invest in? Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll, I'll start. Um, you know, I, I think it comes back to, um, Back to the discussion on disclosure, getting these, getting these most material risks out to the market because what we know after interacting with, with companies over, over time is companies manage what they measure, right? So to the extent that, that these, these material risks are presented for the market to incorporate into the valuation process, to the extent that um, there's a level of consistency and, and comparability across across these material risks at an industry level, we believe that they'll be managed more directly and it gives us the, the disclosure or the discussion about disclosure gives us that window into how the board oversees management's, management's oversight and mitigation of these risks. So it's, it's a starting point for a dialogue. It's that we, we, don't, we don't come to the table with an answer, um, but having, having an insight into how um, how the company is overseeing these risks, and to the extent they don't have a good story to tell, that gives us insight that will help, um, that we believe will help uh, create change over time on a company by company basis, and that will then, you know, create observable leaders and laggards that we can then also use to to promote um, promote adoption of better disclosure. And I'll just add that, you know. We're all in investments. You know what is investments? It's it's about it's about taking certain risks. We don't want to be completely risk averse. We just want to be you know compensated for that risk that we're taking. And so we spend a lot of time. Uh, CalSTRS has had what we call our ESG risk factors for a number of years, and we talk to companies about those risks and how they're managing them, because um, we think that that engagement you know pre. Um, it helps sort of keep that value intact because it's so hard to climb yourself out of a hole, especially when you have these things like what happened with PG&E. Well, <clears throat> no, I think your points are, are excellent. Um, one thing I would add that we haven't really touched on around the whole ESG space is, is the use of, of data providers uh, to measure that risk. Um, you know, we constantly hear about the survey fatigue, the proliferation of standards, 
standard setters around this space absolutely need to convene. I mean, there isn't a, a market interest in, in that. Um, but absent that, then corporations should, should convene together and, and in, within their sectors um, identify those KPIs that are important to them. And, and in those me measures, really what's important is what proliferates up to the board. What is the board seeking to understand? I provided that example before. Very often we don't hear that. So I think it's, it's really important that those KPIs make it up to the board. Take another question. Here's one over this way. Yes, sir. If we in this room were to agree that the frequency of natural catastrophic events is increasing and that those events disrupt society and destroy capital, how is it consistent with the long-term sustainability interest of corporations to have supported the last two years of policies in which the financial condition of the federal government has been materially impaired and the economic security of American citizens has been materially undermined? That's a big question. <laughs> that, that's a political question, yeah, not I, a I, governance question, particularly with the limitation on the last two years. Y yes, ma'am. I, I, yeah, there's a question over here. I'm sorry. Your hand was up. Is, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Okay, so it sorry. seems pretty clear that the gender diversity, there's obviously a, a good case for that. But my question is, taking that a step further, what's been termed in the marketplace as a next gen director, what do you think are the benefits of having that type of a perspective on a board? Younger directors. Well, I'll just, um, I'm gonna put my, take off my counselor's hat for a second and put on, I'm on the board of a $11 billion credit union in California. And we have an interesting um, sort of refreshment process where we, you, we can only have three retirees on the board at any one time. And the whole point of that is that if, if you're, no offense to the 70-year-old you know, um, white guys out there, you don't need a car loan. You don't need a home loan. You're probably not using our mobile app. I mean, we need people in the boardroom um, that are using our products and understand, you know, that can communicate and relate to our beneficiary group or our our, um, our customers. And so I think that applies, you know, across the board to um, a lot of companies. You need people inside the boardroom that reflect your customers, that reflect your employees, that um, are, you know, other wider stakeholder groups. Youth is wasted on the young. Sorry. Or the only problem with being a young director? Because at some point you become an old director. <laughs> <laughs> I've discovered that. Uh, anyone, uh, any other thoughts? On, okay, uh, that uh, other, uh, oh, okay. yeah, I'm, get, I'm getting the hook. Can we do one more? No? no. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the boss speaks. Uh, okay, well look, um, I wanna thank the panel. This is always a good, I always learn something from this one. Um, thank the panel, thank the audience. We've got lunch outside and Bill Cohen is next.